Well, welcome to Family Talk, everyone. I'm your host, Dr. James Dobson, and today we're going to take another look at homeschooling, which many parents are either doing now or they're attracted to. They are motivated, frankly, by two cultural developments. The first is the COVID pandemic, which changed public education dramatically. When my generation grew up, our moms packed little lunches for us and we were scurried off to get on a yellow bus, or as in my case, we walked to a neighborhood school where we spent the next seven hours. Parents trusted teachers in those days because they usually knew them and they felt comfortable with what was going on in the classroom. Then came the pandemic and education became virtual. So that more or less forced parents into the teaching process and they began to see the advantages of spending each day with their much loved kids. This is the first reason homeschooling has grown so rapidly, it's just exponentially in fact, in the last couple of years. It introduced a new experience for children and their parents. Now, the second force driving homeschooling is what I call the radicalization of curricula. Many Christian parents, and even some of those who don't share our faith, are deeply concerned about critical race theory, among other things, which continues to spread across the nation, and they oppose what passes for sex education and a leftist ideology such as LGBT curricula that often begins in kindergarten, which takes my breath away. It's a form of indoctrination that in worst cases warps the young minds of boys and girls and contradicts what moms and dads are trying to teach at home, including biblical concepts of right and wrong. I want to tell you that if our children, speaking of Shirley and me, uh, were young today, we would either put them in Christian schools, which we did anyway, or we would do the job at home. It hadn't been considered when our children were young. One more time, I would like to tell those of you who haven't heard the story of how the modern homeschools movement came to be. I had never heard of it either when our kids were young until a man came along named Dr. Raymond Moore, who is legendary today. And he wrote a book along with his wife, Dorothy, in the late 70s. It was called School Can Wait. It completely revolutionized my thinking. Now, Ray and Dorothy Moore have gone on to heaven, but I wish that they could see the relevance today of what they started. The thesis of Dr. Moore's book was that enrolling young children in formal education is not always the best choice. One of the reasons is because young children are very vulnerable to social pressure. They get pushed around, bullied, they get laughed at, they get called names, and they don't deal with that well, and it's better to delay that process, and they tend to catch up once they have been put in their grade level. You don't have to start with kindergarten. You start where they are, and good things happen to them. They're also given the freedom to learn the fundamentals of reading, writing, and arithmetic at their own pace. So if you've been thinking about homeschooling for your children or grandchildren, Stay tuned because we're going to let you hear a recorded interview with Jay and Heidi St. John on this edition of Family Talk. It was recorded, I believe, in 2010 here at the ministry. And I want to go back to that pre-pandemic era and let a homeschool family tell you why they're doing this and why it's important. Jay and Heidi are founders and executive directors of Firmly Planted Family Ministries. That's a parachurch organization that is dedicated to training and equipping parents to disciple their children. It has a strongly spiritual 
foundation and to teach children the way God intended. The St. John's travel and speak together throughout the year, encouraging couples in their marriages and parenting journeys, using God's Word as their primary source for spiritual growth and discussion. I think you're going to enjoy this interview. With that, let's hear part one of that interview, and we'll hear the balance of it tomorrow. Savannah, our oldest, started in uh, school, and we pulled her out in second grade. So she went through traditional school through the second grade, but none of the other children have ever been to regular school. And Jay, you have been a pastor, and you left that responsibility to help uh, found the homeschool's organization. Explain the title of it. That's right. First Class Homeschool Ministries. And we started our first co-op in 2000 in Mount Vernon, Washington. And then as we moved to Vancouver, Washington, started a co-op there and then another one and was growing and blossoming. Actually, around the country, people were asking, calling and emailing, how do we do what you are doing in Vancouver? And so we realized God's wanting something of us. And so we packaged it up and started helping other people do it, helping churches have a ministry to homes- the homeschooling community. It was and amazing. you're really serious about this. We're very serious oh, yeah. about it. Yeah. <laughs> and we're a little a little not serious sometimes because you have to laugh a lot when you're homeschooling, yeah, but you definitely do. serious about homeschooling. Yeah. Well, you have written a book uh, called Romance, Nurturing Your Marriage uh, Through the Homeschool Years. You're really honest about the challenges of homeschooling. Mm-hmm. It's not an unmixed blessing, is it? No, it isn't. And in fact, um, Jay and I were talking about this morning. I loved um, parenting isn't for cowards. And I said to Jay, homeschooling isn't for cowards. <laughs> <laughs> right. You better know why you're doing it. And so the book is really aimed at um, helping moms remember why they're homeschooling so that when it gets hard, because it, it like yeah. anything else it's worth doing, it has its difficult moments. I always tell people there have been many times when I've watched the school bus go down around the corner and I'll think to myself, I wonder if I just ran out there and just <laughs> asked the guy, I'll give you five bucks if you'll just put all my kids on your bus and take them on your route so I can get a shower, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Little things like that that, um, you know, I want to encourage moms. It's so worth it if you can hang on for the ride. Um, now that we've graduated our oldest from homeschooling, um, I, ca- I, I can speak with much more authority and confidence seeing her become a beautiful young woman. Yeah. It's been absolutely the hardest, best thing we've ever done. Yet That's you're right. about ready to start with a new baby. It's diapers to diploma. That's what we're doing. <laughs> 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 we say that about our program, that it's diapers to diploma. And so we've taken that on as our family. That's our family's a slogan as well. I always tell people I kind of call myself an accidental homeschooler because we were really not fans of the homeschool movement. We didn't really understand it. A lot of people that when we were younger and first married, a lot of people that we knew that were homeschooling, seemed um, it seemed like an unattainable goal for us, just really either really, really conservative or um, academically. I just felt like how could I spend the time and with my kids? all day long. I was used to a traditional school. I, my grandparents put us through, uh, me and my siblings, through a private Christian school, kindergarten through 12th grade. And that's the experience you take into your adult life is what you know. That's what I knew. And it was really the Lord who did uh, a work in my heart. And he started because our um, our second daughter, Sierra, missed the cutoff to go to school with her sister by just a few days because her birthday fell outside of the parameters that they needed. And so in order to kind of keep her happy, I said, well, I'll teach you. I'll, I'll work with you at home. And I realized I sort of took it on that way, and I realized I could teach her to read. And Jay would come home from work, and I would say, honey, look what I can do. I mean, look what Sierra can do. You know, And she would she would read the, a basic word to him, you know cat or whatever. And I that at that moment, I realized how much joy um, I was getting from spending this time with her and teaching her to read and watching her blossom. I mean, she was passing her sister, who was two grades ahead of her in the public school. So we started off kind of cautiously, but once we realized this is amazing um, and committed to it, that's when our real journey began. Uh, speaking of differences, the, um, there are different approaches to homeschooling, too. Uh, describe some of the options that are there. Well, this is a little bit like trying to take a drink from a fire hydrant because there are so many different approaches, but there are some main ones that are sort of mainstream. And I think probably one of the biggest ones is traditional. People call it school at home. 
So, and a lot of people, when they first start homeschooling, this is what you do. Because remember I was saying earlier, you kind of take what you know Mm -hmm. with you into homeschooling. And so it's a good way to start. Um, That'd be more like a traditional approach, like workbooks and traditional textbooks that you can get from a company like Abeka or Alpha Omega. Yeah, Yeah. and you're sitting again. And it takes time to kind of figure out what works for you. So people people call that school at home because you're basically bringing a classroom home. A lot of people, when they start homeschooling, do what I did. I got, you know, desks at a garage sale and I set up my little classroom. But before long, where do you think we ended up? We're at the kitchen table. And Jay was like, well, that's a lot of wasted space down there in the basement. So we converted it back into a family room again. But my point is that that's how we started also was at schooling at home. And then eventually we transitioned into something that's called unit studies. Um, And a unit study is basically taking a subject, like let's say you're going to study, instead of studying whales in the fourth grade and in the the sixth grade, you're studying... um, Western movement. Absolutely. Maybe you're going to study oceans. And while you're studying the ocean, you're going to talk about Jacques Cousteau and you're going to learn about um, different types of vocabulary words that he would have introduced as he was studying the ocean. You're going to learn about whales. You're going to learn about the environment. And you take all kinds of different academic angles and you study the ocean. That is... Is generally what we do in our home because we have so many children. It makes sense for me to take one topic. Like um, I tend to write my own unit studies. I like to um, base them off of missionary stories. So we have studied um, Corey Ten Boom. We have studied so many amazing people who have done amazing things for the Lord. And so when we studied um, Hudson Taylor, for example, we studied China and we studied what was happening during that time period that Hudson Taylor was serving the Lord. And we learned about indigenous people and God's heart for um, for uh, the people of China. And that just brought all kinds of conversations with the kids. When we studied Corey Ten Boom, we learned about the Holocaust. We studied the Netherlands and Holland and mm-hmm. Hitler. Um, and we were so the kids were so fascinated by this because they could relate to a story. If you tell a child a story, they get it. They get it. And all of a sudden they're emotionally attached to this particular time period that we're studying. And we actually quit the rest of the thing that I was planning on doing with them. And we just did Corey Ten Boom for about three months. And we studied. It was amazing. We made a huge timeline, put it up on our wall. They, they never forget. It's amazing. Dr. Ray Moore put great emphasis on working with your child. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about reading books together. I'm talking about um, taking the child to a grocery store with you to do the shopping. That's and right. you learn from that uh, about uh, measurements mm-hmm. and you learn. Uh, budgeting. Yeah, budgeting. <laughs> yeah, all Absolutely. kinds of things. There's, I mean, there's so many things that we do every day that have so many other applications of, that we can teach our children. They can see. Helping them to understand how we need to follow through with things that we do. I mean, just you know, character building things as well as yeah. academic things. All that stuff starts fitting together, and it's just so much more powerful. Jay, what is your role uh, in homeschooling? Well, Heidi is the main educator with the, with the children. Being now that I am, um, I don't have a full time job at the church anymore, so I am m- more flexible. I help more with homeschooling, but I like to encourage dads, which. So many dads ask, what can I do? You know, I have a full-time job. I'm not there. I don't even understand all this academic stuff. How, and how could I contribute to it? And we, I always encourage dads, look, you can be a support to your wife. You don't have to know all the answers of what to do or how it's done, but you can sit down with your wife and say, look, we want to follow God's leading in raising our kids. So I tell the dads, ask your wife what she thinks should be done, and then pray about those things together. Discuss them. Yeah. Go If you can, go with your wife to a um, curriculum store and look at all that's out there. Talk about you know, what your, your kids' strengths and weaknesses, what fits with them, and that is huge. And then telling your wife every day, you're doing amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I can see the progress. Don't quit. Because yeah. just like your kid's growing, you don't see your child growing every day. You don't physically see it, but they are. And yeah. When you're going to work every day and coming home, you see that better than your wife does when they're educating your child. How do you account for the fact that these kids come out so academically gifted frequently? They're, you know, they're kids that have problems with homeschool mm-hmm. too. But mm-hmm. it is amazing how well they do in college, how well they do on standardized tests. And, uh, you know, if you don't take the classical approach mm-hmm. to education, mm-hmm. how do they come out 
with those skills? That's a great question. I honestly think it's because they're in it. They're being tutored. Basically, you're going from a child who maybe be one of 23 to 30 students to being tutored one on one by their mom or their dad. And I think that's the environment in which they're flourishing. And also, you're teaching them to become an independent learner. If we don't know the answer to something, we find it. And while we're looking for that answer as a parent, we're teaching our children how to look for it also. So our kids are very proficient on the internet. If they don't know something like our son was trying to figure out the history of model airplanes, and he just said, Mom, do you mind if I get on Google and find out who made the first model airplane? No, I think, and it's a wonderful opportunity. He's self-directed then, and I think we're teaching these kids, by the time they get out of high school, they are self-motivated, self-directed. They understand the importance of education. They get it. You're not a credentialed teacher. No. Uh, no. Did that scare you in the beginning? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, it scared me. Um, and I realized I don't. I didn't need to be scared after Savannah took her very first standardized test. In Washington State, you are required by law to have your kids tested, um, like the Iowa standardized mm-hmm. test or the CAT-5 or something, every year. And um, when the first year that our kids had to take that test um, – I knew we were going to be okay. They tested, on average, three grade levels above where they were supposed to be. But I'll tell you, I I very rarely hear about a child who's not flourishing in a homeschool environment because if the mom doesn't feel comfortable or she's not sure how to do it, she can find help. There are so many resources out there now. The ministry that Jay and I run is just one of them. So it's an incredible opportunity. Give us the name of it again. It's First Class Homeschool Ministries www.firstclasshomeschool.org. And we have about 50 locations now around the United States. Um, homeschool co-ops that function as ministries of their local church, just like a MOPS program would function as a parachurch ministry or Can a Can they Wana. ask you questions? Absolutely. absolutely. Oh, absolutely. We would Do they in. call you? Yeah. We, have, yeah. We, we give each church um, for these co-ops a website and a database system. So they can manage all their classes and their and the people, the, the parents and the kids. So you work largely through the local church. Absolutely. That's right. Heidi, what do you do when you get a call from a mother who says, I can't do this. I'm exhausted. I never have a minute to myself. <laughs> and I've got these kids around my knees all day, every day. I might cry with her. Yeah. I might. I love those calls because um, I've been there so many times myself. And I always tell them, um, if you need to be talked down out of your tree, you know, here's my phone number. You can call me. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity for, for me to be real with that mom and say, hey, what you're going through, totally normal. It's totally normal. There's nothing in this life that's worth doing that isn't difficult. And the Lord's going to give you the grace that you need. And then it's just a matter of listening to her because most of the time there are fears that just are very easily calmed. And it's just a matter of her needing some time for herself or maybe she needs a little bit of extra encouragement in how to organize her day. Um, A lot of it is just found in being – that encouragement is found in being real and just saying, you know what? It's totally okay to feel like you don't want to do this anymore. I get it. I've been there. Um, When I was younger, homeschool mom, Diana Waring, who's a friend of mine and has written an amazing uh, history curriculum that's now published by Answers in Genesis, she came to speak at an event that I coordinated. And at the end of it, she said, does anyone have any questions? And here I'm, you know, relatively new homeschool mom, but I'm leading this huge group. And I raised my hand. And before I could even get the rest of my sentence, I just start crying. I can't do it anymore. We don't ever finish our whole math assignment. I mean, I was blubbering. And she walked right up to me. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. She put her hand on my shoulder and she said, woman, be loosed. You know, and I thought, well, that's embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> but she went on to tell me, you're expecting too much. You're missing the blessing of homeschooling by expecting all of this of your children. This isn't a, a classroom. This is your home. And integrate your children into it. And that was the beginning. Savannah was in fourth grade at that point. That was the beginning of me realizing this is a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I need to change the way that I'm looking at this. And I went home and I told Jay, I think I've got a little bit more of the piece to the puzzle now. You don't have to be that rigid. That's right. And And in fact, the blessing is found. Okay. And probably better if you're not. That's exactly right. And I, um, one other thing that the Lord really used to show me the amazing opportunity of homeschooling was when I was pregnant with our um, with our fourth child. A little boy had a rough pregnancy and a very difficult delivery, and I couldn't do the things I wanted to do that year. I had this big plan and this mm-hmm. big schedule. The master calendar was on the wall, and I was forced into bed rest. 
And so the kids sat on the bed with me, and they brought their math workbooks, but I read to them. We read the classics. We read missionary stories. We did a lot of reading and a little bit of math. And at the end of the year, when they took their standardized test, they tested better that year than they had any year before and any year since. And I think the Lord was just trying to tell me, when you, my grace is sufficient, mm-hmm. and when you can't do it, I can do it. I take over. It was amazing. How long were you bedridden? How long? It was probably five months, which is a long time in a school year. Five months with kids sitting around the bed. Yeah. Yep. And they they (laughs) flourished. They did great. And it it taught me I need to rely on the Lord. And I needed to. um, And that let me because I'll tell you what. After that year, I wasn't. I have never been as stressed as I was before going into that because I know that whenever I have uh, feel like I have a gap in the kids' education, the Lord is going to cover that for me, and He does beautifully every time. So there's not so much to be worried. We're so we're so worried because we bring in these things from the world, and it's the enemy who comes in and says, "You're not good enough. You're not doing a good enough." job, you're messing up your kids. And it takes those experiences to realize, oh, it's not me who's doing this anyway. It's the Lord doing it through me. And when he does that, the results are phenomenal. When we rely on ourselves and we're, you know, I, I always tell moms, you don't want to be the mom who's running around with your hair on fire. You know, your kids don't want to remember that. Relax and enjoy what God's doing. And the learning comes when these kids are um, in an environment that they are thriving in. I always tell parents, when you start out homeschooling, stick to the core subjects. You want to do reading, read with your kids, and teach them some. Anybody can do second grade math, right? Pick up a math workbook at Walmart, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's not that difficult. What I discovered when I talk about Roman studies is um, instead of teaching each one of our kids um, history separately, science separately, math separately, um, I realized I can take a history book and sit down and read to them like it's a story. And we'll sit around for probably three hours, and we're reading, and they're absorbing this information. And when that's done, they're taking off into kind of different places in the house, and they're writing about what they've learned, and we're, in, we're learning together. I've grown into homeschooling. I didn't start out that I didn't start out doing it that way. I was terrified of homeschooling when I started. And I had to t- go in a little bit at a time, and when it was difficult, I was honest enough with the moms around me who were seasoned to say, "I don't think I can do this anymore." I I feel like I'm in over my head, and the Lord in his mercy every single time has brought someone along who said, "No, no, You're you can good do at it. it." Though I tell you what, <laughs> Do your kids love it? <laughs> they do. They do. Although um, I've had, I love to teach uh, moms who uh, who have reluctant writers because I have reluctant writers in my house, especially the boys. It's not a piece of cake to teach a boy to uh, to write you know, or teach them grammar. And my son, this is how I learned he was a kinesthetic learner. I was trying to get him to write a paper on something that we've been reading. And the, the older girls, I was like, hey, just give me you know a few sentences on Thomas Jefferson. Amazing. You know, we've been studying. We've read about Monticello. Let's do it. Let's write. And they're like, fine. You know, so they went to write, but they weren't super excited. But my son immediately started crying. His wrist went limp. I can't write. It hurts my hand. And I started crying because he was crying. I'm crying. I'm thinking I'm never going to get through this. And finally, in absolute desperation, I put my hands up and I said, fine, you don't like Thomas Jefferson. What do you like? And he kind of perked up. He said, I like Legos, of course, <laughs> like, you know, every nine-year-old boy. I like Legos, and still I'm feeling desperate. And I said, that's fine. How about this? Instead of writing about Thomas Jefferson, because the goal wasn't to get him to understand Thomas Jefferson, remember. The goal was to get him to write. Yeah. So I said, let's write about Legos. And that kid lit up like a Christmas tree. He wrote for me two pages. He was downloading pictures of Legos. Do you know the history of this Lego? We found out that the guy who started Legos actually started out building miniature houses. And Skyler was fascinated. And that, because he was interested, it brought out the learner in him and the writer in him. And that was, I mean, these are light bulb moments for me because I'm realizing I don't have to stick to a set curriculum. I can find out what's interesting to my children and then um, bounce off of that into the next thing. And that's what makes it doable. When you're trying to force a curriculum down a child, or let's say you you bought a curriculum that's just not working for you, mm-hmm. you don't like it, I always tell moms, I don't care if you spent money on it, shelve it. Don't continue using it. You, um, The benefit, one of the benefits of homeschooling is that you can work with something until you find something that works for you. You want it to work for you. What works for me may not work for you, and vice versa. So we have tremendous freedom to figure out what it is that our kids are really fascinated by and what it is that we like to teach. So you find out what you're – like I've learned – that I am an auditory learner Mm -hmm. because I'm homeschooling. I love to listen to things. Well, my daughter Savannah is – 
is a visual learner. She likes to read. And so she, if she reads and Sierra listens, they're happy. It took me a while to figure that out. And that's the, the benefit. I think if you cannot get scared and overwhelmed by looking ahead, just look where you are. Well, Heidi and Jay, this has been so uh, enlightening and so inspirational. Uh, Heidi particularly, but both of you, uh, are not just talking theoretically. You've been there. You've done it. And you have answers to the questions that people ask because you've heard them a thousand times. And I've got about a thousand more. <laughs> and so uh, will you come back? Absolutely. Absolutely. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. <laughs> okay. The, the name of the book that you've written, which we didn't talk about today, is The Busy Homeschool Mom's Guide to Romance, Nurturing Your Marriage Through the Homeschool Years. A lot of practical stuff here. Absolutely. And uh, we will sooner or later talk about that here on Family Talk. Thanks for being with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Children certainly learn in different ways, don't they? If you want to learn more about Jay and Heidi St. John and their homeschooling ministry, and also Heidi's ministry to moms called Faith That Speaks, you can find links on our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org forward slash family talk. And be sure to join Dr. Dobson again tomorrow for part two of this conversation with Jay and Heidi St. John. Now, if you enjoy listening to Family Talk every day, and we know you do, be sure to sign up for Dr. Dobson's free monthly newsletter. You can sign up at the bottom of our homepage when you go to drjamesdobson.org, and be sure to check out the other free resources that are available there as well. Well, I'm Roger Marsh. Thanks so much for listening today to Family Talk, the voice you trust for the family you love. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.